after you sign me. Just keep going. Going. Count six, aggravated abuse, a second degree felony. She did inside the head. I'm not a nigga. I made mistakes. Hell no, man. David St. John is currently facing multiple charges, including aggravated sexual assault in Houston, Texas. According to reports, St. John allegedly took a teen girl to a motel and assaulted her at gunpoint. At the time of this incident, he was already awaiting trial for three other offenses, which included possession of the pistol used during the alleged assault. Mr. St. John, you are charged with the felony offenses of felon in possession of an aggravated assault of a older than but younger than 17. In court, while the judge was seemingly distracted with another matter, St. John did something shocking. After you sign the you know you know While in court, St. John repeatedly asked, did you learn your lesson before suddenly punching a man? Fortunately, an officer quickly subdued him. Even while being handcuffed, St. John continued to offer advice. The reason behind St. John's attack on the man remained unclear. However, before leaving the courtroom, he offered one final word of wisdom. Don't end up like me. Uh -huh. Fortunately for St. John, the man he attacked chose not to press charges. However, St. John pleaded guilty to his original charges and received two 25-year sentences. In the Florida penalty trial of Bessman Okafor, convicted for the murder of 19-year-old Alex Zaldivar, prosecutors argued that Okafor executed the teen to prevent him from testifying. During a Spencer hearing, a procedure under Florida law that permits defendants to introduce additional evidence during sentencing, Zaldivar's father testified. As you will see, he directed comments at Okafor that the convicted murderer found displeasing. I've run out of adjectives. I don't know what to say to this man anymore. But today will be the last time that I will get to see him. But I will see you in 10 years. Objection, Your Honor. Thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Zaldivar. Mr. Zaldivar. No, please. Please, that's sit down. Best one. Best one. Best one. Let's take him outside for just a moment. Mr. Asher, can you take that photograph? In the courtroom, Mr. Zaldivar confronted the defendant, Besman Okafor, telling him, you're dead. Okafor responded with curses and threatened, I'll show you how gangster I am, before being removed from the courtroom. The intervention of the special response team of Orange County Sheriff's deputies was crucial in maintaining order. Okafor was sentenced to death, but the certainty of this sentence is now in question. This is due to changes in Florida law requiring a unanimous jury vote for the death penalty. Ruby Frankie has pled guilty to multiple counts of aggravated child abuse in a Utah court. Known for her strict parenting approach, Frankie blamed her former business partner for the incidents leading to the charges. Despite her plea, she maintains that her ex-partner's influence and actions are the fault. Six, aggravated abuse, a second degree felony. With my deepest regret and sorrow for my family and my children, guilty. Ruby Frankie, aged 41, gained notoriety through her YouTube channel, where she shared her life with her husband and six children. I'm gonna take you through what our routine has looked like. One example of her no-nonsense parenting occurred when her daughter forgot her lunch for school. Hopefully nobody gives her food and nobody steps in and gives her a lunch. However, her fame took a hit last August when one of her sons appeared at a neighbor's house, leading to a series of events that raised concerns. I just had 
Eight-year-old boy still up here at my front door asking for help. He's emaciated. He's got around his legs. He's hungry and he's thirsty. Both Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt were charged with child abuse. Guilty. Ruby Frankie now claims that Jody Hildebrandt's influence biased her sense of morality. She faces legal consequences for her actions toward her children. Leticia Gonzalez is facing charges for the deaths of her three sons after she drove her SUV into an ice-covered pond while under the influence. In August, she entered a no-contest plea to charges of operating a vehicle while intoxicated, causing serious injury, along with three misdemeanor counts related to moving violations causing death. Thank you, this is people of the state of Michigan versus Leticia Gonzalez, case number 2345792FH. Today is the date and time uh, scheduled for sentencing. I have provided the notice of appellate rights to opposing counsel. I do believe that there's corrections uh, that need to be made to the scoring of the guidelines and potential uh, pre-sentence investigation report. Right, so let's go over these from the top. On the PRVs, PRV1 is 0, PRV2 is 0, 3 is 0, PRV4 is 0, PRV5 is 10, 6 is 0, 7 is 0, so a total of 10 points based upon three misdemeanor convictions and puts her in the C category. Is that correct, Mr. Tuberman? That's correct. Is that correct, counsel? And I believe that the criminal history has reported uh, counts four misdemeanors, but would still stay at 10 points. Okay. Uh, so that would be correct. Uh, I would note this is the third PSI we've had in this case. This is the first uh, iteration where it contains these additional um, convictions. So, it, so long as those convictions are accurate, then yes, the scoring is accurate on the PRVs. The, for whatever reason, there were some convictions that are on the local system here on the AS400 that were not included, and they have now been included, so that's where they came from. On the OVs, OV3 is at 50, OV9 is at 10, uh, 17 is at 5, and 18 is at 10. Mr. Tubergen, is that what you're advocating for? That's what I'm advocating, Your Honor. In addition, OB13 is currently scored 25. The people believe it should be scored zero. Points. Zero. Right. So 75 points on the OVs. What's the defense's position? That's correct, Your Honor. Uh, a total of uh, 75 points in offense variables. Um, correct. The, the court did correctly um, state which which point values are, are correct there. Okay. Uh, that brings the OB to an OB level uh, six, and the guideline range then to 12 to 24 months. All right. Allocution or yes, go ahead. Your Honor, um, one, one addition, if I may. Sure. Um, page 9 under medical history, I believe that was um, made known to the uh, pre-sentence uh, reporter um, under physical health should list. Um, excuse me, cardiomyopathy and chronic heart failure diagnosed uh, December 2021. Thank you. And DOC has made that change, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Anything else? Nothing further as it relates to the pre-sentence report. All right. Allocution? The prosecution argued that Gonzalez consumed drugs, putting her children's lives at risk. The court is well aware of the facts and circumstances from this case. Ms. Gonzalez has been in this court in a number of different hearings. At the bottom line, Your Honor, uh, Ms. Gonzalez uh, decided to take her methadone, uh, which is a controlled substance, uh, then sought out additional methadone on the day that this occurred. She was driving home, lost control of her vehicle, and for all intents and purposes, there was no reason to lose control of her vehicle other than due to the ingestion of the methadone. The vehicle did roll into the, into the pond and ultimately did cause the death of her three children. Uh, like I said, the court is well aware of the fact and circumstances of this case. There are three dead children at this point in time due to the defense actions. Because of that, we are asking the court to take that into consideration and fashion an appropriate sentence. Does your client need to sit down for this? Okay, you may continue. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. The defense then presented their side of the argument. The theme here that uh, you're, you're going to hear several times is that uh, Ms. Gonzalez, she's just already serving a life sentence, and, and that's, that's, that's true. Um, she's lost her children, and prior to this, it's not like her life was, was all that easy to begin with. Um, and meeting with Leticia and knowing her for the, the past well, well over a year at this point, um, She's been processing through the stages of grief. We've seen the denial, the anger, uh, it, all of it. Um, and she's been before the court now twice to accept responsibility for, uh, for, for her actions. 
Uh, she's been on bond for well over a year. Um, been monitored to both the probation department as well as the community and, and um, folks that are heavily invested in, in monitoring her and making sure that she's staying on the right path here. Um, and she's had no violations. Uh, we've not had to be in front of the court for even towing the line on, on those conditions. Um, furthermore, the court has reviewed um, the memo that was submitted by the defense team. Um, she's detoxed from all of her medical assisted therapies um, that she was using to wean herself off of the opiate ab uh, ab abuse. Um, there are all parties prior to today, uh, after careful consideration, we all sat down, uh, considered the case, considered the facts, considered all the, the, the factors, and we agreed that 365 days was an appropriate sentence, regardless of what philosophy you, you, you prescribe to, whether it's punishment, deterrence, uh, discipline. Um, the only thing that has changed now in this case is that the charge and the guidelines now reflect uh, that to be an appropriate sentence. I would ask the court to um, sentenced to a, a local jail sentence with some probation uh, to make sure that um, as she is grieving that Otis is not um, tempted to, to fall back into uh, other substances. Um, but again, as far as I've known her, uh, her resolve has always been very strong. Um, that, that's not going to be an issue. Uh, but I would ask the court to um, sentence to a local time of probation. Thank you. The judge then offered Gonzalez an opportunity to address the court. Uh, Ms. Gonzalez, have you had an adequate opportunity to read and review the pre-sentence report? Yes, sir. Any additions or corrections that you wish to make? Uh, no. Anything you would like to say before sentence is imposed? Um, yeah, I'd like to Go ahead. Um, I've lived with survival, well, with survival guilt since February 17, 2022. And I continue to hate myself every day, Your Honor. But I want to apologize to my kids' family and to the community, and most of all to my kids, because life without them has been difficult. I just pray that they know that I'm nothing without them and that it was just an accident. They were the reason, they were the reason that I chose to change my life and I chose to never look back and be seen in another courtroom in trouble. Um, being their mom was all I ever wanted. Each day I tried coming to terms with my reality. But my reality is just a nightmare. That day seems to stick with me, with depression and flashbacks from each and every day. I often find myself asking God why, because they're hurt. It's indescribable. I love them so much. I love you boys to the moon and back. <laughs> with everything I have inside me, but Your Honor, I'm willing to accept the responsibility for my actions. Because as a mother, I feel that I have failed. But even though my life has changed, I'm asking for mercy. I'm crying out for help, help to understand that this, help to understand this mentally and physically. Because I would, I would like to grieve I'm living in pain and remorse every day. And I just want my boys to know that I'm sorry for everything. <laughs> and if I could give my life and change places, I swear I would. Life without them will never be the same, Your Honor. I lost everything I ever needed, and I hate myself so much. I've been sentenced to life without them. <laughs> for the rest of my life, so I'm asking for forgiveness. And also to my three boys that lost their lives, but yet here I stand still asking you for mercy. I'm willing to take the responsibility as the mother, and as a mother should, 
But I would like to like my boys to know that I'm sorry from the bottom of my heart. And I hope that they can forgive me. And I hope the community and you can forgive me, Your Honor. But I will always love my boys with all of you. The judge then shared some remarks with Leticia. No one is suggesting that anything that happened here was intentional at all. By the same token, when the court looks at the pre-sentence investigation report, it indicates that you had obtained illicit methadone on multiple occasions from this other individual. And unfortunately, your children were in the motor vehicle when you did that. So this was not a one-time situation in which you succumbed to pressures or desires to use drugs. Rather, this seems to be a pattern, and unfortunately, your children paid the ultimate price for that. And then historically, when the court looks at your contacts with the justice system in all the arenas, uh, back in 2016, 2017, and preceding and post, you had your parental rights terminated to at least two children, I think three now. And that was for neglect and drug use and abuse situations. So this has been a long-term pattern of placing your children at risk uh, because of drug usage. And now you have lost three. So therefore, the court does believe that a substantial sanction is warranted because this was not a one bad night situation which we have a horrific tragedy. The judge then announced the verdict. It was the sentence of his court on the OWI causing serious injury that he turned over to the MDOC for a minimum of 24 months and a maximum of 60 months on um, all three counts of uh, motor vehicle causing death. Those are misdemeanors. The sentences will be the same 365 days in jail credit for 71. All of these are concurrent. Must be state cost, crime, victim costs, and DNA fees that are required by statute. This is the final sentence. You may file an application to the Court of Appeals regarding your conviction and sentence. If you're unable to hire an attorney, this court will appoint one to represent you at public expense. You need to fill out the paper. Keep it provided. Return it within 42 days. The sentence is within guidelines, and prison has been imposed due to the reasons I have articulated. She received a prison sentence ranging from a minimum of 24 months to a maximum of 60 months, which is approximately two to five years. Next, we see Robin Howington in court, convicted of killing her own daughter. Before delivering the verdict, the judge addresses her with some remarks. Ms. Howington, this is a strange case. This is one of the more unusual cases among the hundreds that I've tried as a lawyer or as a judge. Um, but there are a couple of things in this case that are just glaringly obvious. I agree with what General Good just said a few minutes ago. You are not the victim in this case. You have a previous history of criminal convictions or criminal behavior. Uh, what you had before the night uh, that this tragedy occurred was not very significant, although you were engaged, engaged in the trafficking of illicit narcotics, and the court can consider that. But I really don't know how you could have um, made this much worse than what you did that night. Within literally minutes uh, of when your daughter had been shot and killed, you were attempting to hide the firearm that was used to kill her. You're not concerned. You weren't then. You're not now. You're not concerned with trying to protect Gavin. You're concerned with trying to protect Gavin's mother. And you have been, you were that night, and I will believe that from this point forward. I don't know how you could interpret this evidence any other way. You have a previous history of criminal conviction, criminal behavior. You tried to hide the gun that was used to kill your daughter uh, while her body was still warm. When you were taken to UT Hospital to be checked for shock before you spoke with law enforcement, you attempted to solicit another, solicit another person uh, to take your cell phone so that it couldn't be looked at, and then you tried to destroy the cell phone. Within seconds, if not minutes, of when your daughter was you're calling 911 and making up a story about how it all happened. And repetitively, I quit counting at about 20, uh, repetitively throughout hours worth of police interviews, not just that night, but on other occasions as well, uh, you made up story after story after story. And this court can consider every bit of that as criminal conduct. So 
uh, you clearly have a previous history of criminal convictions or criminal behavior which enhances your sentence in this case. As to count two, the aggravated child neglect where there was serious bodily injury, uh, count enhancement factor number nine applies as well. A firearm and your handling of that firearm is the reason that your daughter is not here now. It's not because Antoine Oliver showed up two days earlier. Um, I simply, it, it strains the bounds of credulity to believe that your boyfriend just laid that down where a small toddler could just walk in within two or three minutes after you and your children arrived home, found the gun, pointed it at your daughter, and pulled the trigger. When that been in that same place for 24 to 36 hours and nobody saw it. I just, I, I will never believe that. And I don't think you were honest with the jury about how that happened. But the simple fact remains that uh, however he found it, you were responsible for that gun. What I believe happened, if in fact it was your child that had the gun, uh, when the bullet was fired that killed your daughter, there was a man that came in. And I don't know if it really was somebody to collect window tent payments like you testified to or if it was a, a, a pill deal, but somebody came in. It was a strange man in your house, and I believe you had that gun for protection. I believe you had a round chambered and the safety off, and that gun was left there, and when you stepped out to smoke, the tragedy occurred. But that's on you and nobody else. So I, th I place great significance on the two enhancement factors that I found your history as well as uh, the firearm use in this case. Uh, as stated previously, the, the mitigating factors, um, this was an unusual case. There are unusual circumstances, but I don't place much weight on that as far as mitigating your punishment. So if you would, please, ma'am, stand up. As the reality of her situation sets in, Howington breaks down in tears. Then, Judge Scott Green proceeds to deliver the sentence. Ms. Allington, in docket number 117659, based upon the jury's verdict of guilt, finding you guilty in count one of the lesser included offense of reckless homicide, you were found guilty of that offense and sentenced to a term of three years to serve within the Tennessee Department of Correction as a range one offender. In count two, based upon the jury's verdict of guilt, finding you guilty of aggravated child neglect, you were found guilty of that offense and sentenced to a term of 22 years to serve within the Tennessee Department of Correction as a range one offender. In count four, based upon the jury's verdict of guilt, finding you guilty of false report, a class D felony, you were found guilty of that offense and sentenced to a term of three years to serve within the Tennessee Department of Correction as a range one offender. In count five, based upon the jury's verdict of guilt, finding you guilty of tampering with evidence, a class C felony, you were found guilty of that offense and sentenced to a term of five years to serve within the Tennessee Department of Correction as a range one offender. And finally, in count six, based upon the jury's verdict of guilt, finding you guilty of attempted tampering with evidence, a class D felony, you were sentenced to a term of three years to serve within the Tennessee Department of Correction as a range one offender. These sentences will be served concurrently one with the other for a total aggregate sentence of 22 years to serve within the Tennessee Department of Correction. And as your attorney has pointed out, uh, the service rate is at 85%. I wish we weren't here. I know that you wish you weren't here. Mr. Oliver wishes that we weren't here, but you're the one responsible. That'll be the judgment of the court. Good luck to you. Judge Scott Green sentenced Robin Howington to 22 years in prison for the death of her daughter, Destiny. He expressed disbelief in Howington's claim that her two-year-old son was responsible for firing the weapon. Meet Joshua Mosley, a man caught up in a murder case down in South Carolina. He stands accused of the tragic killing of his girlfriend, Drenica Hopper. She was shot in the head and tragically passed away from her injuries while in the hospital. Mosley found himself behind bars, facing charges of murder and possession of a weapon during a violent crime. As his case unfolded, the prosecution presented the chilling details during his bond hearing. Your Honor, this occurred back on January 8, 2017, Your Honor. A Cherokee County Sheriff's Office was called, Your Honor, to 378 Morris Drive in Gaffney, South Carolina, Cherokee County, Your Honor. And he found a, um, may not be around this one, Hopper in the um, bed. She had been shot inside the head. Well, through the additional investigation, they found he made statements about her. The courtroom was filled with the somber presence of Drenica's family members during the hearing. In a rare and emotional moment, the judge granted them permission to approach Mosley directly. The first to speak was the grieving mother, who bravely addressed her daughter's killer. 
I don't know what to say today. But I just want to know and let, and let him know that you know Joshua took my baby away from me. And you was wrong for that. You done destroy my family. I hope you don't never get out. Following the mother's heartfelt words, the victim's uncle and brother also stepped forward to address Mosley. <coughs> um, I really didn't think about what I was going to say. Uh, I just wanted you to know that even though in your mind she may have not meant much to you, she meant so much to us. Um, this is not even words can explain like what you took from our family. Um, I just, at the end of the day, we're all wondering why. I just want to know why. Why? Who gave you the power? Who put it in your hand that you could just take another person's life? You hurt my family, and you just took my sister like. Like, it don't mean that to nobody. Like, that's yours. Like, you ain't had no choice. Like, you in control of life. You ain't got no control of karma. Consequences. There are consequences. Without legal representation, Mosley expressed a desire to speak directly to the victim's family. The judge, although granting permission, issued a cautionary warning before allowing Mosley to proceed. At this point, I just want you to answer me yes or no. Would you like to make a statement at this hearing? Yes. Before you do, Mr. Mosley, let me just caution you again that it is not in your best interest to make a statement. You do not have representation here today. You do have a right to remain silent. Now, are, are you under the influence of or alcohol or anything? No. All right, sir. Eventually, a court officer had to calm everyone down. Ultimately, Mosley's bond was denied, and he was sent back to prison. His murder charge was later dismissed for a lack of evidence. The case still remains open. I don't cry like this. I'm a grown man. And I do not cry like this for anybody. My mama has cancer. She's locked, she, I'm locked up for two years right now. I can't do anything for my mama. And if Nika was here, she would tell everyone you, that I did nothing wrong. I did not harm Nika. I made mistakes. Me and Nika, we both made mistakes. We made mistakes. We broke. I did not harm me, I want that very clear. I did not harm me. My lawyer told me, do not come in here and make a statement when the time comes because it can't be used against me. I don't give a fuck if tell against me. I don't care about the prison time. I want everybody to know the truth. I did not harm me because I never, we never, we were arguing. We had no reason to be mad at each other. We had no reason to want to harm each other. She was playing with the I don't know why she put it to her head. She made a mistake. She accidentally Amidst escalating emotions, a court officer stepped in to calm everyone down. Mosley's bond request was ultimately denied, and he was returned to prison. The murder charge against him was later dismissed due to insufficient evidence, leaving the case still open. Judges are often seen as holding the moral high ground, issuing fines and sentences to those who've committed criminal offenses or misdemeanors, like driving under the influence. So, it's surprising when they find themselves on the wrong side of the law. In this case, police officers responded to a crash scene where an SUV had careened off an icy ramp and ended up in a ditch. They found a 55-year-old woman in the car, who was promptly arrested. She refused to take a field sobriety test or a breathalyzer. When pressed further, she admitted to being intoxicated and out of her mind. Adding to the shock, she revealed that she's a judge. You're intoxicated. You... I am so intoxicated. Fortunately, the officer had his body camera activated, capturing the entire interaction. Police confirmed that the individual in question was indeed Portage County Common Pleas Judge Becky Doherty. 
she was taken to the Bromfield Police Station and booked on a first-degree misdemeanor charge of driving under the influence. Video footage revealed Judge Doherty being disruptive, refusing to comply with instructions, and even asking the officers if they were aware of her identity. Clearly impaired, she struggled to maintain her balance and was visibly distraught, even vomiting at the side of her car when officers found her. In a heartbreaking moment, she disclosed that she had lost one of her children. She requested that the officers contact County Sheriff Major Larry Limbert, though their attempts to reach him were unsuccessful. Subsequently, she was arraigned, pleaded guilty, and received a sentence of 180 days in jail. Additionally, her driving license was suspended for a year, and she was mandated to attend a driving course. However, her sentence was later reduced, though her license remained suspended. She paid a fine of $375 and was required to participate in a three-day driver's intervention program. This is Mitchell Savickas. In January 2016, a tragic incident unfolded in Michigan, where 19-year-old Mitchell Savickas, accompanied by his then 16-year-old brother Daniel Benavidez, was involved in the shooting death of teenager Isaiah Blue. Benavidez, despite having a toy gun, participated in the robbery, and later pleaded guilty to second-degree murder, receiving a sentence of 20 to 40 years in prison. Savikas, who was 19 at the time, was convicted of felony murder and sentenced to life behind bars. Savikas and Blue had previously crossed paths in juvenile detention, with Savikas admitting in court that he harbored animosity toward Blue. Representing himself in court, Savikas claimed he acted in self-defense when he shot Blue. However, CCTV footage and police evidence painted a different picture. During the trial, the judge called upon Isaiah Blue's mother, Claressa Seaton, to deliver a victim impact statement. Through tears and intense grief, she bravely confronted her son's killers, labeling them as cowardly individuals who wielded a gun as if they were playing God. It was a deeply heart-wrenching moment as Claressa Seaton faced the individuals responsible for her son's untimely death. I cannot help but to feel sorry for you. You are too young to be here. You, not, you have not only stolen from me, you stolen from the from those that love you too. You stole from yourself. Savikas remained silent when given the opportunity to speak, indicating he had nothing to say. However, Benavidez took a different stance and apologized to Blue's family. I want to apologize to Isaiah Blue's mother, his friends, and the rest of his family. I'm not a good speaker and all, but these words coming from my heart. Indeed, Benavidez's expression of remorse is a crucial step, and it's our hope that he heeds Seton's advice for his own well-being. Shane Goldsby, a prisoner in Washington state, received an additional 24-year sentence for the murder of his cellmate, Robert Munger, a 70-year-old convicted of child abuse. Goldsby, 26, pleaded guilty to second-degree murder for beating Munger to death in June 2020 at the Airway Heights Correctional Center, where Munger was serving a 43-year term. Goldsby explained that he snapped upon learning of Munger's crimes, especially because one of Munger's victims was his own younger sister, who is still a child. In a fit of rage, Goldsby attacked Munger from behind in a common area, striking him multiple times in the face and stomping on his head. Munger succumbed to his injuries three days later. This tragic incident sheds light on the complexities and emotional toll within the prison system. Give me details about what happened and what he did, about the photos and the videos of him doing this stuff, and it was building up. They put me in a position that I... I shouldn't even be in to begin with, you know? This shouldn't, this shouldn't have happened at all, okay? You talking this dude, that did some sick, twisted things to my little sis. Cindy Elliott, the mother of the girl who was victimized, bravely spoke out, revealing that Munger had raped her daughter. Additionally, an unnamed source confirmed this information to the station. Goldsby expressed disbelief upon learning of Munger's actions. Upon discovering Munger's identity, he even requested a new cellmate, but his plea was denied. What did you, like, think when you realized it was him? I was in shock, dude. I was like, what the f***? You talking out the blue that they sent me to the same institution, the same unit, the same pod, in the same cell as the dude that got locked up because of what he did to my little sis. What did he do? He raped my little sis. The same pod in the same cell as this dude, okay? 
That's like hitting a jackpot in a casino seven times. Munger's crimes came to light when he was convicted of child rape, child abuse in December 2019. Meanwhile, Goldsby's own criminal history involved stealing a police car in 2017. He led officers on a lengthy chase before crashing the stolen vehicle into a Washington State Patrol car, causing injury to a trooper inside. Despite the widespread orders for everyone to stay at home during the height of the 2020 pandemic, Judge Pinky Carr seemed to be following a different set of rules as she persisted with her regular court proceedings. The person is not here, as I've noted all week. Corona, day three. If this had been her first instance of misbehavior, it might have been brushed off as an obsessive dedication to work, perhaps earning her a warning. However, Judge Pinky Carr's track record told a different story. The Board of Professional Conduct submitted a 58-page report to the Ohio Supreme Court, outlining over 100 instances of misconduct. These included inappropriate attire, such as wearing tank tops to court and even ordering someone's arrest for rolling their eyes. Initially, Carr denied accusations that she had ordered the arrest of individuals who didn't appear in court during the pandemic. However, video evidence told a different tale, showing her issuing bonds and jail terms to people who had rightfully stayed home. Hearing no response, note the time, 8.55, officer present, no defendant, KPS will be issued. Carr's attorney, Nicholas Froning, argued in court that Carr's misbehavior came from her struggles with sleep apnea and menopause, which contributed to her generalized anxiety disorder. Although Carr admitted to many allegations against her, Froning attempted to show how these medical conditions can impact individuals differently. Despite Froning's efforts, the Ohio Supreme Court was unmoved. They chose to suspend Carr indefinitely. However, there is a possibility for her to reapply after two years, provided she submits a report from a medical professional affirming her capability and competence to practice law. This is Shakira Graham, a 24-year-old woman who was convicted of murdering Meshach Cornwall, a man from Garfield Heights whom she met on a dating site in late 2018. During the trial, the prosecution requested the judge to charge Graham with two counts of aggravated murder. Um, and Mr. Prosecutor, do you have an uh... Which one you're going to be sentenced under? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, we would agree with the court's position. Uh, we do believe that counts one through six are allied offenses. Uh, and based on this fact, Your Honor, we would be asking this court to sentence the defendant, Ms. Graham, to count two aggravated murder. Okay, thank you. Following the trial, Mayshock Cornwall's mother delivered a victim impact statement. On December 17th, I boarded a plane at 8 o'clock. My life was fine. I got off that plane around 9.30, December 17th. My life was fine. I put my keys in my side door, and as I entered my home, I found my 27-year-old son at the bottom of the stairs. That was the impact that affected my life until this very day, until the day I died. Mishak, I was blessed to be Mishak mom. He was the best thing that ever happened to me. People always used to compliment me about how wonderful my son was. He never gave me no problems, Your Honor, besides a feeding ticket or going to traffic court. You understand me. I had a wonderful son. He loved his mother. We had a good relationship. <sighs> Michak was loving and Michak was kind. He loved to laugh. He enjoyed going to work. He's the only person I know love going to work. He was in the hospital for two weeks, and all he keep asking the doctor is, when are you going to relieve me to go to work? The doctor say, you're the only person I know who want to go to work. Most people ask me for days off. You asking me to go to work. That's how committed he was to his job. He enjoyed playing his PlayStation. He enjoyed computers. He enjoyed eating pizza. He enjoyed drinking different beers. I got turned on to Great Lake Bay because of my son. Every year a flavor come out, he brought it to the house. Our family is very small, your honor. My mother only had four kids. There's only three of us left. Me and my sister only had one child apiece. I lost my son on December 17th. He 
never forgot a birthday. He never forgot a Christmas. He never forgot a Mother's Day. He gave the best gift. <laughs> My son was getting his credit together. He wanted to buy a house in a couple years. Your Honor, my life right now is filled with sorrow, pain, an everlasting yearning for what I could never have back. I sat here for two weeks and my heart grieved for this young lady even though she took my son away because she is just so foolish and ignorant to waste her life and to take my son's life and for what? A PlayStation, some weed, a liquor, two guns. I mean, how long did that last her? A day? Come on now, they said they threw her out the hotel the next day. So how long did that money last her? She took my son's life, Your Honor. I am asking the court to give this young lady the harshest penalty you can give her for taking my 12 year old son. That's all I have to say, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Graham's defense attorney then presented their case. Mr. Sims? Your Honor, may it please the court, um, on behalf of Ms. Graham, um, uh, we are sorry about what happened to Misha. We are sorry that that day happened. Um, Your Honor, um, and as we sit here at different ends of the table, we sit here at different tables because we see the case differently. Uh, and um, as Ms. Graham sits here today, she, uh, again, um, is still insisting, Your Honor, upon her innocence in this case. And I think one of the things that the, the state of Ohio mentioned the text messages. And if you recall the text messages between her and Meshach back and forth, you saw the caring they had for each other. Judge, you sat there and you saw it yourself. Um, again, the jury um, saw it a different way. Judge, I think that the jury lost their way in my opinion, but that was the verdict. That's how we work. We, 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 live, in, we live with the verdict given us by the jury. We don't always agree with the verdict, but that was their verdict. And again, Judge, uh, she's very sorry and compassionate and um, wish, wish that that day never happened to someone that she really cared about. And Judge, uh, again, uh, she has a very modest uh, criminal history, as you, as you know. And uh, we know certain sentences in this case, such as this case, uh, statutory, and she understands she's looking at a life sentence, Judge. But uh, again, she has indicated to me she vows to appeal her sentence in this matter, Judge, and uh, she vows to not stop fighting until she wins her innocence in this matter. Next, Shakira's father addressed the court. Thank you, Judge, for letting me uh, address the court. Um, I appreciate the way in which you conducted this uh, court. I, I sat here too for two weeks. I'm Shakira's father. Her mother's also present in the courtroom, along with her stepmother and also other members of our family. I do apologize. I do uh, want to express my sympathy to uh, Ms. Harrington in the death of her son. I want to say simply, as I sat here, I want you to know I've been a pastor, I'm a United Methodist pastor, and I've served in that capacity for 34 years. Her mother's also a pastor. In my 34 years as a pastor, on nine occasions, I have stood with families and I've eulogized their family members that have been murdered, many who are unsolved. One of the persons in the courtroom today who has been here is Sister Denise McCray, her son, 29 years old, murdered in Cincinnati. I eulogized her son. Just in January, 
I eulogized the son of a friend who was Shakira's age in Akron, Ohio on New Year's Eve. My daughter was raised in a home with pastors. She was taught right from wrong. It is my full belief I accept the decision of the court. But as her father, as someone who knows her, I do not believe that my daughter committed the act that she has been convicted of. I simply ask, Judge, that you would use your discretion as you have in her sentencing. She has two small children at home, and I know that you are required by law to do what you must do. I will pray for her. I will pray for this family. And I pray that all will somehow find healing. And I pray for a day of justice. I pray that somehow the person who committed the act will be found. In the meantime, the court has spoken. And I pray that you would just show leniency that one day my daughter may be able to embrace her two young children who await her at home. I thank you for allowing me to address this court. And I pray. Uh, Again, I just pray for all of those impacted by what has happened the death of this young man. Thank you for letting me address the court. The judge allowed Shakira to address the court next. I would like to first thank you for the part that you played and partaking in justice. I would like to thank everybody who seeks justice. Um, and I would like to express my condolences to the Shots family. I would also like to acknowledge that I did not come to trial as a self-possessed, seeking to be found not guilty and killed as a Wow, I came to trial to fight for my innocence. And I'm sorry for what happened to me, Shad, and I will continue to fight for my innocence. Thank you. Her attorney attempted to mitigate Graham's charges. Seven State of Ohio versus Shakira Graham. In count two of the indictment, it is the sentence of this court for the aggravated murder of Meshach Cornwell that the defendant is sentenced to the Ohio Reformatory for Women for a term of life imprisonment with parole eligibility after serving 25 years in prison. The defendant is sentenced to a three year term of imprisonment pursuant to Ohio Revised Code 29. 41.145A prior to and consecutive to the commencement of the life sentence. As to count seven grand theft, a felony of the fourth degree, the, descent, the defendant is sentenced to a term of 18 months at the Ohio Reformatory for Women. As to count eight, receiving stolen property, the defendant is sentenced to a term of 18 months at the Ohio Reformatory for Women. The sentence shall run concurrent to one another and concurrent to count two of the indictment. The defendant shall be given the time served in the amount of 373 days. Shakira Graham, it is my duty to inform you of your appellate rights that you possess here today pursuant to Ohio Criminal Rule 32B. Uh, this is notification of your right to appeal pursuant to this rule. Uh, since you have been found guilty and sentenced to prison, you have a mandatory right to appeal. Uh, as indicated by your lawyer, and uh, with your uh, uh, statement of it, are you una unable to pay the cost of the appeal? Okay. Then counsel will be appointed for you without cost. That if you are, are you unable to pay the cost of documents necessary to appeal? Yes. The documents will be provided without cost. The defendant has right to have a notice of appeal timely filed on her behalf. And uh, that would be your last duty, Mr. Sims, to have that notice of appeal filed? Yeah, that would be filed this week. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, therefore, then, uh, we will order that the transcript be provided at state's cost, and counsel will uh, be appointed and will be in the, either today's journal entry or by the end of the week. Uh, anything further from the state of Ohio? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Anything further from the defendant? Your Honor, thank you. Okay. Nothing further. Adjournment, then. The judge sentenced Shakira Graham to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Graham will become eligible for parole in 2045. Additionally, she received credit for the time she has already served in jail, counting towards her sentence. 
This is the case of Derek Romano, who confessed to an investigator that he and Jeremiah Roberts had been drinking homemade wine in their cell at Wabash Valley Correctional Facility before things turned deadly. Romano is now facing charges for the killing of Roberts. Both Romano and Roberts shared a cell and had violent histories. Roberts, age 32 at the time, and Romano, age 28, were previously found guilty of the brutal murder of John Sullivan, a pizza delivery driver in Indianapolis in 2014. In a heinous act, they lured Sullivan into their trap, killed him, hid his body in a basement, and stole his car. After two days on the run, Roberts and Romano were apprehended in Wyoming. In 2017, an Indianapolis jury convicted Roberts of the murder and robbery of Sullivan, sentencing him to 68 years in prison. Romano, who pleaded guilty, received a 55-year sentence. On Sunday morning, May 3rd, staff at Wabash Valley Correctional Facility discovered Roberts unresponsive in his cell. Tragically, he was pronounced dead shortly afterward. Police quickly suspected foul play and classified it as a homicide. Romano was subsequently charged in Sullivan Superior Court with Robert's murder. A statement of probable cause revealed that Romano confessed to a state police officer on the day Robert's body was found, admitting that he had killed his cellmate using his hands and feet. According to the statement, Romano admitted to the officer, Yes, it was a stupid fight over stupid stuff, dumb stuff. He explained that he and Roberts argued about trivial matters, particularly about who was right or wrong. Roberts mistakenly believed Romano was implying he was wrong about things. However, Romano clarified that their disagreement escalated over spelling words and debating whether capitalizing the first letter alters the word's meaning. Romano recounted initiating the altercation with a blow that rendered Roberts unconscious before continuing to strike him. He acknowledged being fully aware of his actions while punching and kicking Roberts while he was defenseless on the ground. The statement indicates that Romano confessed to knowing his actions when he placed Roberts back in his bunk and listened for his breathing to cease. Notably, online court records reveal that Romano did not have legal representation. The Indiana Department of Correction declined to address whether Roberts and Romano should have been assigned to the same cell, in line with departmental regulations or policies. Romano informed the officer that he and Roberts were not friends, but rather accomplices in wrongdoing, with Roberts being the reason for Romano's imprisonment. Romano agreed to a deal to secure his release from county jail, but he ultimately pleaded guilty to murder despite having no involvement with the victim. According to the document, Romano struck Roberts after he got too close and made physical contact by touching his shoulder. This blow rendered Roberts unconscious, initiating the fatal assault. Additionally, the statement reveals that Romano sent text messages to family members discussing the act of killing someone. Despite admitting to the detective that he likely intended to kill Roberts, the statement revealed that Romano had left a message on the wall of their cell, reading, Pray for the man who died here, for he lived and died a better man than me. Additionally, state police announced they were investigating another inmate's death at Wabash Valley. Kevin J. Carpenter, aged 57, from Churubusco, was found unconscious in his cell on Sunday, prompting suspicions of foul play. Authorities are considering the possibility that another individual may have murdered Carpenter. The night of June 28, 2015, in South Cumminsville, Ohio, marked a tragic turning point in Rukiye Abdul Mutakalim's life. Her son, 39-year-old Navy veteran Suleiman Ahmed Abdul Mutakalim, was fatally shot in the back of the head as he walked home, carrying a bag of food from a nearby White Castle. Police investigation uncovered that he was an innocent bystander, tragically caught in the crossfire of a failed robbery. Shockingly, his wallet contained less than $60, the courtroom proceedings following the tragic death of Suleiman Abdul Mutakalim were deeply emotional. Two teenagers, Javon Coulter and Valentino Patis, were charged and later found guilty of involuntary manslaughter with a gun specification and aggravated robbery with a gun specification. Remarkably, Javon was only 14 years old at the time of the crime. For Rukiye Abdul Mutakalim, the pain of losing her son was compounded by the heart-wrenching experience of witnessing his killers being sentenced to prison. I don't hate you. I can't hate you. It's not our way. Showing rahma, mercy, that is our way. 
Rukie's response was truly remarkable. Instead of seeking revenge, she stunned everyone in the courtroom with deep compassion. She approached Javon and embraced him, offering forgiveness and expressing her willingness to be a part of his life. In her heartfelt words to Javon, she extended a hand of reconciliation, showing a remarkable capacity for forgiveness and understanding. My family would like very much to be a part of your seeing a better way of life so that this does not repeat itself. Rukie's forgiveness of Javon Coulter in the courtroom was unexpected and left many surprised. Despite the tragedy of losing her son, she chose to extend compassion and offer to be a part of Javon's life. Rukie's perspective is unique. She sees Coulter and his accomplices as individuals who can be redeemed despite their crimes. Rukie's approach is rooted in compassion and a belief in the potential for redemption. She plans to visit them regularly in prison, offering support and guidance to help them improve their lives. For Rukie, vengeance is not the solution. It won't bring back her son or resolve anything. Instead, she aims to support the young men who took her son's life, proving that there's a path to a better life and helping them find their way to it. And you were a baby, and you are still a child. Rukie sees her son's killers as children who have mothers just like herself. Two years after Suleiman's you came face to face with the boy who took his life. At 66 years old, Rukie didn't limit her compassion to just Javan. She also embraced Javan's mother, and the two women shared a tearful moment of comfort. Javan, who was just a child when he committed the crime, was visibly touched by Rukie's words and actions. He expressed sincere remorse for his actions and offered a heartfelt apology to Rukie and her family. Scott Nelson was convicted of the murder of nanny Jennifer Fulford. After robbing a home in Florida and then kidnapping her, he admitted on the stand that he killed her to eliminate her as a witness. However, the trial then shifted to determining his punishment, life in prison, or the death penalty. During the penalty phase, Roy Gravett, a federal prison expert, testified that Nelson had conflicts with Muslim inmates while imprisoned. Displeased with how he was being depicted, Nelson made his objections known during the trial. Poor, poor. Can you read back the question? Mr. Wolf, Mr. Nelson has shown no adverse effects for the special housing. Can you call me? I'm sorry. Please taste Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson, you need to take a moment. Mr. Nelson, you need to take a moment with your turn. Hold on, sir. Sir. Members of the jury, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson, are we clear that you're going to stop talking? I need a verbal affirmative. Yes. Mr. Nelson, talk talk with your attorneys, and then your attorneys. We, I, I'm going to, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Nelson, Ms. Simmons has asked for a moment to talk with you privately. I'm going to grant her request, and you're going to have that opportunity. You need to follow the deputy's instructions so they can facilitate this. Okay, go ahead. It's highly irregular for a defendant to interrupt testimony during trial proceedings. While Nelson's desire to refute accusations of racism amidst admitting to murder is notable, it's ultimately up to the jury to consider all factors in their decision. In a surprising turn, Despite Nelson's request for the death penalty, the jury opted to sentence him to life in prison. Big thanks to our viewers for joining the courtroom journey with us. Your interest in the stories of justice is what keeps our channel alive.